Will doctor strikes make waiting lists longer? Could rent caps help tenants? And can the high street survive? This is Politics Live. Joining me in the studio are the Conservative MP Siobhan Bailey, Labour peer Baroness Kennedy, the founder of Conservative Home Tim Montgomery and the SNP MP Richard Thompson. Today, doctors in okay. England staged the biggest walkout so far in the ongoing dispute over pay, but could the government force them back to work? We are hemorrhaging talent overseas. We are in a situation where the brightest and the best in schools and aren't going to go into medicine. It's about getting a balance between protecting people's right to strike, but also recognising that time-critical, urgent and emergency care needs to be delivered. We'll hear from one woman who's facing a long wait for her hip replacement. Private sector rents are at record levels. One viewer tells us how hard it is for tenants. I was thrust into a horribly overheated marketplace uh, where I estimate about 20 people were looking for every property that was um, being offered. And as more Wilco stores close today, can the high street survive the loss of another major brand? Hello, and we start today with the closure of yet more Wilco stores. Let's have a look at this front page of the Daily Mirror. Wilco store closures, full list of 86 shops shutting this week is yours on the list. Uh, a lot of people seemingly very upset about the closure of these Wilco, Wilco stores. We now know uh, about 12,500 jobs at risk. No clue if they can be saved. And uh, at the same time, we know that 14% of stores on our high streets are empty. Tim, do you use your local high street? I do. Actually, I live in Salisbury and we've just had a Primark open. And last week there were queues to get into it. Now, I don't know what the impact on local, other local shops are, whether it's going to bring more people into Salisbury to shop there or whether it's going to take uh, shopping away. But there is still a hunger, I think, out there for real, you know, traditional shopping, not just online. That experience that you get through feeling the clothes and looking at the beautiful displays, I think people still want it. And in a way, the absence of it during the pandemic, etc., maybe there's more of a hunger for it than there was. I certainly hope so, because seeing that lively high street last week in Salisbury was, was a joy, actually. Mm. And, uh, do, do they want it, Helena Kennedy? Because the numbers would suggest the amount of online shopping that is happening would suggest that actually, whilst people might like the idea of it, practically, that they're not using their high street. The, 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 well, there's no doubt that the whole business of being able to just uh, um, get something easily on Amazon, if you're working your socks off, as so many people in our society are having to work long hours, um, they're feeling burned out. We're going to be talking about doctors in a minute. Um, and, and I think that it's so easy to just um, um, order things. That I don't think that's going to change. But what I think is such a sadness is that uh, lots of the stores that you really want, you need, you know, the butchers, the bakers, but also this stuff where you want, where you know, uh, older people want to be able to buy gifts for their, their grandchildren, they want to be able to get uh, cards, all of that sort of stuff, you want the ease of being able to go to the, lo the local uh, community stores and, and hardware stores, you know, where mm. people need plugs, they need uh, batteries, they need all those kind of things. And uh, I just think that, uh, and I do think there is, I mean, I think Tim's right, there is something pleasurable about, certainly for me in relation to clothes. I never feel comfortable, you know, um, about uh, the business of ordering things online. They're almost invariably, to me, a disappointment. And if you're someone who's not a standard size, uh, <laughs> whose bottom is bigger than the perhaps <laughs> should be, then you know, it, just, it just doesn't work. So I, I actually like the business of, of, of trying things on and being there and yeah. making a choice. Siobhan, practically, though, uh, people seem to have this kind of almost nostalgic affection for the idea of a high street. Mm. But in practical terms, 
is it savable in the long term? The high street's been changing for a number of years and I think in some respects the pandemic has fast, both fast forwarded some of those changes and the, the behaviour habits online but also because more people are working at home they've got more access to the high streets and in Stroud, Stonehouse, Durns, Dursley and Nailsworth, my little towns, you know, there, there's a lot of independent shops, we pride ourselves on that so the experiences uh, are right but I mean, we've seen a steady decline of the big, uh, of the big uh, budget brands going as well, you know, uh, Peacock and M and Co, uh, and that that poses difficulties for people that want sort of uh, cheaper goods on the high street. But there is no doubt about it um, that the high streets are changing. I think it requires some in, uh, interesting kind of innovation of pr uh, private investment uh, in addition to state funding. We know that the levelling up, you know, every area the in the country fund. can apply in to, to get some cash. But I think it needs a, a really good business the, case I mean, to get taxpayers' cash. The government with the idea of the online sales tax, but that mm. actually was scrapped. That's because actually online retail Rate retailers have certain advantages, don't they, mm. over people who are on the high street having to pay rent and other other. Yeah, local I mean, taxes. Uh, bricks and mortar shops uh, and small businesses will say to you, business rates uh, and uh, are, are something that needs reform. And they also look to the big kind of big ticket online uh, people like Amazon who who don't have so those could overheads. So the government be doing more on that? Well, listen, I mean, it, it's yeah. not it's not a simple issue, and that because of the fast nature, uh, fast paced changing of the online world, I think. It is quite difficult to make the, the changes that will make the difference, but ultimately we've got to just follow the trend of, of human behaviour, and, and I think that our high streets are managing to do that to some degree. I think there are things though, that can be done. I mean, I do think that we should be encouraging uh, young people who have got business ideas to be set, going there, mm -hmm. and you can only do that by not having rating levels that are so huge. But the problem is that local councils have been have had their uh, grants from central government reduced incredibly, and so therefore the need to uh, tax in other ways um, leads to um, rents being too high, rates being too high, all of that. And I think that uh, there is a problem here that has to be addressed in a much more systemic way. Richard. Absolutely. I mean, like Shabani, across my constituency, there's a number of small towns that have got fantastic local high streets, uh, you know, Ellen and Inverurie. And I think there's very much a case that people have to either use it or lose it. It's very, very convenient to click online and get something delivered to you. Also, I think that uh, pre-pandemic uh, shops were, t or a n number of shops suffered from almost being like showrooms where you went to, to look to try and yeah. then you went and bought it online for mm -hmm. to save a couple of quid. And I think that's something that really impels I mean, a classic example in Aberdeen that breaks my heart still to walk past it is Bruce Miller's. It was a shop that sold musical instruments, sheet music, great big televisions, nice coffee. I loved it. But says it was, the violinist. Says the violinist. <laughs> but, it, but it was done for by the... Uh, by, by the ability to buy things just a bit cheaper o o online. So I think we have to use it or lose it, but Helena's right, Baroness Kennedy's right. It is about uh, incentives and business rates sometimes. In Scotland, there's a small business bonus scheme which uh, exempts many of the small traders from having to pay uh, the full whack of business rates. But also sometimes I think uh, landlords who own these premises have to be realistic about what they are going yeah. to get in the current market. But I think also environmental improvements, and that's where the, mm. the, the, the councils and the government can come in uh, to tidy places up, to tidy town and city centres up and actually make them places that people want to spend time in. Mm. Because if people want to spend time in those places, they'll also spend money. Yeah, the evolution of the high street. OK, we're going to leave that there and move on now uh, and talk about the doctor's strike because for the first time this week, uh, the consultants have started today, uh, junior doctors in England go on strike tomorrow and this is the first time in the history of NHS that we've had consultants and junior doctors on strike at the same time. Uh, let's have a look at the headline on The Guardian this morning. Uh, they led with biggest walkout the NHS has ever seen will put patients at risk. Health body warns the NHS Confederation says hospitals will cancel more appointments and operations than ever before. Uh, this, of course, on the back of the news last week that waiting times are now at their highest levels. Uh, 7.6 million people on waiting lists at the end of July. Um, we can speak to one of those people now. Jane Ambrose is an NHS patient who's currently on the waiting list for a hip replacement. Jane, thank you very much for joining us on the programme uh, today. Well, can you explain to us how long you have been waiting? I have been waiting, it's um, over, well over a year now, from when I first had I'd had a previous hip replacement, my right hip. 
I so I decided to have a private consultation to make sure that the symptoms I were having were the same with my left hip. I had that private consultation last September and was told, yes, this is it. It's a year's waiting list. I, I had an NHS appointment. I, I paid privately for the consultation, but I can't afford 15,000 for a hip. Um, my um, NHS appointment for the consultation was 27th of February this year. So I was expecting, as I've been a year, I was going to have that done this September. When I asked for that to be confirmed, I was told, oh, well, it's a year from today, from the 27th of February. So, in effect, mm. it's now looking at not this month or next month. It's looking like next March, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, um, it, unless, it's, unless, of course, it is, unfortunately, postponed again. I mean, we hear... I the, think it will be. We, <laughs> Um, unfortunately, you know, we, we hear these figures, the number of people on waiting lists, Jane, but for those that don't understand, I mean, what are your pain levels like? How does this affect your daily life uh, whilst you're waiting? It's extremely difficult. Um, it is impacted further because I'm full-time carer for our um, autistic, mentally ill son who has physical difficulties and I have to move him about. Um, you can imagine walking backwards is hard for somebody who hasn't got hip difficulties. Mm. I'm on very strong painkillers, which I am constantly having to speak to my GP about. I've been on this one, this last one, for about two months, two or three months, I'd say. So the, but I am thinking I need to up it again. Yeah, so having having to wait is having a practical impact because you are also a carer, as well as the, the pain that you're suffering, you're also a carer. <laughs> It, Siobhan, if you stick stick with us, sense. Jane, stay with me, I'll, I'll come back to you. Siobhan, when you hear stories like Jane's, is the fact that the government has failed to deal with the industrial action from doctors, uh, you know, is that not an embarrassment to you as a Conservative MP? Well, listen, I think every MP has got constituents who has had uh, 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 operations or procedures cancelled due to strikes. The strikes need to come to an end, but it's not right to say that the government hasn't done anything. I am absolutely clear that these strikes should end. I think we get into a situation where you can't talk about um, the NHS or the NHS workforce uh, uh, without sort of having to say, we love them, we love them, we love them, but that there needs to there needs to be a point where these strikes end and the, the government actually backed the independent pay body the government has made it absolutely clear the position on pay uh, and yet the BMA has, is still pushing these strikes forward and I think the public are now looking and saying well hang on a minute if teachers and nurses can come to an agreement uh, on on pay uh, following the independent pay body's uh, advice then what is the situation with the doctors and I think we've got to make those changes. Okay. Baroness Kennedy. Well, I mean, I, I have great sympathy with Jane, um, I, and, uh, I, I, you know, the, the, this is one of the, those difficult things um, where people are suffering the consequences. However, we've got to be very clear and say to the public, who should we be directing our anger against um, in relation to this? Who is it we should be unhappy with? And we should be deeply unhappy with the way that the government has dealt with this. It's, it's been 16 years since um, the, the uh, doctors, and I don't call them junior doctors because some of them are people who are now nearly 40 and who have been studying for years, they've become members of royal colleges, and with the real problem here has been a, a, a deliberate, I think, attrition against the, the, the National Health Service because of the, there are lots of vultures hovering around the private sector, um, American uh, health companies and so on, wanting to swoop in. So I feel very strongly Direct our anger at the right people. The government should have been doing something about this a long time ago. They deliberately have driven the National Health Service Jane, into the ground. Jane, can I ask you to respond to that? Who, do you, who are you angry at, if anyone? You know, are you angry at the doctors? Are you angry at the government? I'm angry at the government. I feel <laughs> this keeps me back, battered backwards and forwards. There needs to be a sit round the table. The doctors, the consultants, all the medical staff need to be paid what they're worth. There is money that the government spends on lots of other issues, and that could be directed here. It's, it's as though 
the governments the disease and the actual strikes are the symptoms. Tim, the government, is the, the government is the disease. That's pretty powerful well, for James. The reality actually is that if you look at the total amount of spending now by the state, health and pensions are taking up an ever-increasing proportion as we get an older society. So we just particular. stop. So you know, you actually the services that are being squeezed are defence, local government, because actually the government is funding the NHS and pensions to an extraordinary extent. And what I think where most people are at, I think, and I think this is the danger for doctors now, is people are reasonable. And they know that we face a huge problem post-pandemic. The budgets of Western countries are all squeezed. Being offered nearly 10% is much more than most people, patients who are waiting for treatment will get. There is a long-term problem for recruitment for certain NHS workforce uh, members. We do need to recruit more doctors. We do need to address the fact that some doctors are going abroad. But now is not the time to be giving anything like a 33% pay settlement. And the fact is that actually English junior doctors have been offered something similar to what actually junior doctors in Scotland have settled for. But what the, you reveal from a lot of the leaders of the BMA when they say what's the difference is a political agenda. A lot of these junior doctors are wanting to cause damage to a Conservative government. The BMA has always been a very political um, organisation. Let's and stop I think calling them junior doctors. Let me, let me just say that uh, th this is really, really something that we've got to ag agree with. Over, over the whole period of 13 years of Conservative government, we have seen a decrease in public spending in relation to many public services. And so when you say... Not health, the, when, when you, Not no, health, no, yes, health. Yes, Not, and no, no. 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 You're saying the proportion, Tim, I'm listening to your words. The but real spending has gone spending, up as well. Real spending has because, gone up. Because a lot of te technology costs a lot of money. The wages and the, the salaries of people who've spent years studying, who are committed to the health of their patients, they have not gone up. So let's be very clear. And don't make a comparison. These are professional people who are go we're going to lose them to other countries. And I'm just, I, I'm really alarmed that there's such but dismissiveness this is, about this. This, this okay. is the big Labour lie, though. That Labour it's people come, Labour politicians come onto these programmes all the time, talk about Tories spending cut and then you say where mm. are you going to put up taxes where are you going to fund this war every time you talk about cuts 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 you have no plan to address this because honestly britain is at the limit of the tax burden mm. we have to make hard choices and unfortunately labor aren't willing to make the hard we choices we spend less on health than, than most european countries let's bring let's in richard here. here because tim you were just referring to scotland and and insinuating that it was a political decision for the BMA to, to call off their strikes in Scotland. But in fact, the Scottish Government made a, a, a more generous offer to the doctors. No, it did indeed. And I think the, the, the difficulty that, that the argument that Tim's putting forward is that if you ask the general public to make a choice between believing politicians or siding with the doctors, they're instinctively going to side with, with, with doctors. But yeah, there was a more generous uh, offer made in Scotland. There was a more collaborative approach. There was actual negotiations. There was not uh, any attempt to try and demonise a legitimate demands from, from doctors and we've seen that also with the rail strikes you know the rail strikes were dealt with in, in uh, or threat of rail strikes were dealt with in Scotland because the government actually negotiated now it seems to be that there's the, the, the UK government the Conservatives seem to see this as a wedge issue they want to conjure up demons of the 1970s yeah. and trade unions and well, it seems to that there's it seems to me, and I think a great many other people, that this is being used as a kind of wedge issue yeah. to try and demonise dedicated I, I, I public think, sector workers. I think, and I think that the, the key to dealing with this, because there are many pa problems that need to be dealt with in the NHS right across the four nations of the UK post-pandemic, but the way to solve it is to get it working better and to make sure people are Tim adequately rewarded on, for the effort that we expect of them. What Tim touched on is the context that we're in. We have just come out of a pandemic. We spent four or five hundred billion pounds whereby we actually shut a lot of the country down to protect the NHS and the NHS workforce. The whole country needs to come together and to pull ourselves out of that. The tough economic situation that we are in with inflation means that in wage increases have a, a negative impact on us being able to bring that inflation down. And, and the, what the government doesn't have the luxury of, which the BMA does, which I think is being political now and they're pushing it to the absolute <coughs> limits because they think they can smell blood 
about is that the government can't just focus on junior doctors or consultants. The government has to look across the whole of the public sector. So if the government was to give a 35 inc pay increase, percent pay increase to junior doctors, what about the armed forces and the police and the teachers? Yet, yet we've got agreements everywhere else. And I think to your point, Richard, when you're saying people do trust us, we, we love our doctors. You know, my mum's a nurse. We absolutely love our frontline NHS work stuff. But what the issue is here is no longer the individual doctors, it's about the BMA and it's about the unions across the piece. And I think we've got to be very clear. This isn't a situation where government hasn't committed to uh, increased pay increases for the doctors and the consultants. It's about average of 8.8% for, uh, for the doctors and about 6% for the consultants. These are pay increases going up. Consultants will go up to sort of near 100 grand. You know, the, the, these are highly paid people with good futures. And the other thing I would say is the BMA's number one number one request was about the pensions. So what we we made sure that there was a, a preferable so the government stepped the, the in government and, stepped and, in has, and did that. Has. But then the BMA said, "Well, bank that, and we'll have something." But else. in the, ca still in the, ca in the case of the junior doctors, they're not the BMA are not here to represent themselves. But they would say uh, this is about pay restitution because they have seen their pay squeezed over more than a decade. But you have to deal with the context of the, the country finds itself right now. No, no. Uh, and and the, the and actually the independent pay body has taken into account all of the historic pay increases and situation and, and inflation and everything else. So I think, you know, before the Rishi, the Prime Minister, was announcing an agreement with the pay body, everyone was saying he wasn't going to do it and we were panicking about wanting to get to the pay body. They gave the pay body and then like, oh, that's not good enough, well, so keep moving. Thinking about um, next steps, let's mm. have a look at the front of the Times now. Um, this is the action that the Health Secretary uh, has announced he's taking today. Uh, doctors on strike, uh, government to unveil plans for minimum minimum service levels. I mean, Siobhan, some people would say the timing of this is horrendous. If you want to come to some kind of agreement with the doctors, if you want to find a solution, uh, threatening them with being unable to take industrial action is not the way of doing it. Well, it, it, there's, there's no there's no stopping people striking. There will be there will be an ability to strike even with the minimum service levels. We put this legislation; it's primary legislation. We went through all of this earlier in the year. We know that countries like Australia and Canada actually ban blue light services from going on strike. We are actually looking much more at providing a Sunday service. So, if there's particular doctors who want to go on strike, they will be able to do so. But the reason that these announcements made is when we look across the country, about 17 areas, 17 trusts had agreements with local BMA representation and the trusts which involved the doctors where they said, OK, we'll get to the point where we've organised the logistics so we can provide a service to local people to get their hip operations and get their um, dialysis and chemo. Very important. But then the national BMA swooped in and said, no, 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 you're not doing that. So actually, I do think there needs... And, and when you say about um, whether this is a threat. You know, we're thinking about the unions, we're thinking about the doctors again. Actually, the patients want to see government doing absolutely everything they possibly can to bring the strikes to the end. The, the Prime Minister has been so clear on pay, we've got to look at other issues. Baroness Candy. Oh, it, it's, a, it's a sad thing um, because for 13 years the, the business of freezing um, uh, the wages of consultants and of, of doctors who've well, the studied Labour for Party seven years saying just they'll go further. Oh, uh, just, yeah, well, hold on a minute. Mm. Um, the whole business is that the National Health Service was created by a Labour Party that is very committed to it. I don't believe Most that the Conservative... Most of its life it's been under a Conservative government. Yes, and, and let me just tell you what's happened is a shift in the Conservative, the nature of a Conservative government. That business of one nation conservatism which believed in the National Health Service. This has been about an erosion of the National Health Service and to part privatise it. And that has definitely been a no, deliberate no, thing no, being no, done over 13 no years. Andy Burnham did more absolute, privatisation than the Conservatives did. There is absolutely That's the fact. Of Even it. the King's Helena. Fund have no. said that there's it, no, not, the not, no evidence. No, the King's Fund is very clear every, about every, what's every, happening every to the quality every of, of, of the war. Campaign. Every, right. every Labour Party you're campaign. You're deprofessionalising the professions. That's what you've been doing. But every Labour Party campaign I can remember at a general election says, if you vote Conservative, the Tories will privatise the National Health and Service. It's been and, it every, and, and every it election has been, been a lie. Okay. Every election all right. has been a lie. No, OK, been all right, it. people at home can't hear when we <laughs> when we all talk over each other. It's but we, we are, in fact, going to leave that there. I just want to say thank you very much to Jane, who joined us this morning. And we, we wish you uh, all the luck with your uh, hip replacement, Jane. I hope thank that uh, you get it Thanks as soon as much. possible. Thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you.
Uh, right, we are going to move on now and talk about rental properties. Let's take a look at this headline from the BBC. Yesterday, rental prices rise at the fastest rate for nine years, figures show. Um, I want to hear first up from someone who's directly affected by this. Um, this is a viewer of ours who we spoke to just before the programme, Peter uh, Klukas, who's a pensioner in Wiltshire. I was thrust into a horribly overheated marketplace uh, where I estimate about 20 people were looking for every property that was um, being offered. And you had to have something different to offer to put you to the head of the queue. Uh, so uh, in my case, I had to give a year's rent up front uh, obviously, that's several thousand pounds uh, in order to, sec to secure my place among the 20 people who were looking for uh, a, a, a rental property. That was the only way in which I could secure anything. Uh, and that's how I am living where I am now. OK, that was Peter Kukas, who lives in Wiltshire and is a te private tenant and is clearly struggling, found it very, very difficult um, to find a home. Um, if I start with you, Richard, the government in Scotland did something pretty dramatic, didn't it? It introduced um, rent controls. Just talk us through that. How is it working? Well, uh, during the pandemic, there was an emergency bill, pa emergency legislation passed by the, the, the Scottish Parliament uh, to protect uh, the rights of uh, tenants, to uh, increase their rights over the tenure, to give them greater redress in the event of unlawful uh, evictions by landlords. And there was also a cap placed on those the existing tenancies of uh, rent increases of 3%. And I think that's been of enormous help to people throughout that. Now, of course, there are when a tenancy changes, uh, those restrictions don't apply. My understanding is that it was that the emergency legislation could not lawfully apply to uh, any future tenancies, which is why there is that has been described as a loophole. And I think. You could, you've got a very neat example there of what happens when you don't have rent controls because rents have in those under those tenancies that have turned over have increased. Uh, not far behind is some other parts of the UK, you know, Edinburgh and Glasgow rents yeah, are up. I mean, but in fact, if I just show you mm -hmm. the front, there's a Telegraph headline here um, which sort of lays this out really. Rents rising faster in Scotland than in London, London mm -hmm. as Sturgeon's war on uh, well, landlords I, I backfires. Think, I think, to be fair, I would expect no less from the Daily Tory graph than to put that sort of spin on it. But untrue. But rents are rising very fast but could, in but, Scotland. But, aren't not, they? But, but in, they're also rising at a rate which isn't significantly above some other parts of England. So I think what that shows is that you have an example of what happens where rent controls apply and where they don't apply. And actually, it would be a good thing if we had extended rent controls right across the sector, because that way then we'd be able to protect people through the cost, so, this cost of living crisis. But let's not forget that there's multiple reasons why we're in this cost of housing crisis as part of the cost of living crisis. There aren't enough affordable homes. Now, the Scottish Government has uh, built 120,000 since 2007, 86,000 of those for social rent. There's been another 110,000 built by 2032. So that's going some way to meeting the, the demand that is there. But fundamentally, with interest rates going up because of the disastrous mismanagement of the economy uh, by, 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 by the present UK government. You know, we need to take radical steps to tackle housing, which is one of the most significant costs that anybody is ever going and, to incur. And you mentioned that loophole be the, of the thing between tenancies, which is apparently that is what is pushing up the rents in, in parts of Scotland. Is that something that Hamza Youssef is, is planning to close, that loophole? Well, I would hope he, he does, but you know, that loop, you know, there are no rent controls elsewhere in the UK and rents are also increasing at a very, very high rate. So I think what it shows isn't that there's a it isn't that there's a, a, any kind of a, there's a gap that I think can be addressed there, but where those rent controls aren't in place elsewhere in the UK, you're seeing a very similar effect. So actually, rent controls, I think this shows work, and I would like to see it extended right across the rental market Shake, to protect people. Shaking your head there, Tim. Well, the thing is, I'll, look, there's a massive problem in the housing market. We need to build more houses. I'm a Conservative, but I think probably one of the Conservatives' biggest failures in office is not to build houses. We're talking about, you know, just been talking about the pressures on the National Health Service. If we spend much less money on subsidising private landlords through housing benefits of various kinds, we would have more money for the National Health Service, one of the areas where we really could reduce the size of government. But rent controls don't work. They are a false solution because 
ultimately, if private landlords can't make the kind of money that they need to to make that uh, letting m m work for them, they won't bring their properties onto the market or they will you know, use them for a different purpose. Okay. So it, the rent controls don't work. And despite what Richard said, actually, rents are going up faster in Scotland than in other parts of the UK. Well, what, what purpose are they going to put those empty properties to? Are they going to just sit and pay a mortgage on them and not collect any rent at all just because they can't put the rents up by as much as they like? Converted to other purposes okay. as well. Uh, do, what does Labour think of this idea of, of well, rent listen, I mean, I think, I think housing is going to be one of the big issues um, uh, in the election next year. And one of the things that uh, has driven up the cost of, uh, of, uh, of rent has been that so many people were encouraged and given um, uh, the opportunities to buy to rent. And, and huge numbers of people did that. And as a result, um, their incomes are re reliant upon uh, uh, their, their rents. And some of them have got mortgages, which were buy to lay mortgages um, and uh, and that's le leaving them with a great uh, burden on their shoulders and they're passing it on to the tenant and I, I mean I come across all the time young people who come out of university they can't afford places to live um, they're living in, you know in the most extraordinary ways um, in order to survive in London um, and I, I know that's true around the country and so we, we're in a crisis where I mean young policemen can't afford it uh, uh, young doctors can't young lawyers but but young workers in any any of these places and they often have to move outside of town and then they spend tons of money on, on transport to get to work so, and spend hours of course doing it and so it's no wonder that we have a society that's feeling deeply unhappy mm -hmm. and at the heart of it is one of the main issues is having a proper home, a place that you can call yours. But is there a danger in the short term? I mean we, we, you mentioned people who have taken out mortgages to, uh, to rent out rent. homes as their yeah. business. Um, we've seen interest rates of course rising, we've got the, mm -hmm. the renters reform bill coming in some of those people are saying it's now a hostile environment for landlords mm. and they are leaving i mean there are figures from the national association of property buyers that say around a hundred thousand mm. of these landlords will be will just quit the market they'll just leave the business yeah. and then the situation's worse isn't it Shabon? and would be made triply worse if there was rent controls brought in. You know, I think state intervention into uh, the rental market usually uh, ends badly. But listen, I think um, one of the reasons the Renters Reform Act is, is coming into Parliament um, shortly, it was a manifesto commitment, it was in that recognition that people are uh, renting for longer periods. Individuals and families, we heard from Peter earlier, uh, are renting for a long time. So what Michael Gove, the Secretary of State, is absolutely passionate about is improving standards for uh, people who are renting, giving them the same opportunities like owning pets and but things. So, so that's one side. But, but there, is a, a, there is a balance to be struck whereby you increase standards, you protect the renters, you give tenants a really good uh, living standard and life, but you don't spook the landlords or make it so expensive and prohibitive to own properties. And, and I think... And isn't the central point what Tim was saying, yeah. though, is that there just aren't enough homes? Well, I think yeah. building supply, I think we can all agree that there needs to be more homes. Homes and built, the and I think it's field in that regard. I, I, no, I, I mean, I think we built more, but built more homes than, than the Labour. The Labour so it's one of my few but, hopes, actually, for a yeah. Labour government. Actually, and I don't want a Labour government. Although, although we just saw their stance on the neutral, neutrality, and that, that, it was, a, it was that's a, a, true. A, a but I think one of the reasons why the Conservatives haven't built houses in the parts of the country where they most need them is the NIMBY vote. Yeah. And the fact is that these are Conservative held seats, and the Conservatives are frightened of them. Labour will build in these areas partly because they don't have the political downside mm. that the Conservatives but, have about face. So, about and not necessarily for the most borders. pure of think, motives. Do, have you got a new building in, in Stroud? Oh yes, I mean we, we, we've got buildings building in Stroud but we've got a local plan and a, a Labour Green Council has just messed up the local plan. But anyway, I, I, um, <laughs> I, I, I say, but what I would say, just to, 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 <laughs> to your point Lizzie on landlords, it is really important as we see this, le this legislation come through that we do not demonise landlords. About 40% of landlords are single property owning. This is their life's works, often their pension. They really are good landlords in many respects and we had evidence to the DWP select committee to, okay. to, to a lot of what you were saying about that landlords are exiting the market so I think there is a balance to be right. struck but I think it's right to raise standards okay. in the meantime. Okay all right I'm afraid we're gonna to have to leave that there and we're now going to look some pictures at some pictures of the Princess of Wales. Uh, oh <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, gasps in the studio there um, of course <laughs>
The Princess of Wales inflating a life jacket. Uh, lots of lots of smiles, <laughs> bit of a mishap. Um, she seems to be absolutely as popular as ever, and you can see a lot. There are lots of pictures of this incident with a life jacket and all the papers. Let's have a look at the coverage on the Daily Telegraph. There, you can see laughing away. Never seems to put a foot wrong. Um, but does that a year after the death of the Queen translate to popularity uh, with the monarchy? Well, someone who has written on this is uh, Dr. Ed Owens. He, he has a new book out called After Elizabeth, Can the Monarchy Save Itself? Can it, Ed? Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me on. Yes, the monarchy can save itself. Um, but as I seek to emphasise in this new book, uh, it hasn't undergone any great sense of modernization really in th the last 30 years um it's been free floating in that respect and now i think the king has an opportunity to really uh to really grip the steering wheel and transform this institution bringing it up to date and into the 21st century now when you say grip the steering wheel you're talking about quite dramatic steps one of the things you suggest is that mm. he would you know resign <laughs> Abde <laughs> abdicate. <laughs> but not, but not, <laughs> He'd go, that's but it, not I'm, before I'm, reinventing I'm the institution. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, because we have to think back to what abdication represented for the, for the late Queen. Um, it was anathema to her, because, partly because what happened in 1936, yes. when her own father, George VI, took over Edward VIII following his abdication. So she was never going to abdicate. But when we look at European monarchies, what they tend to do is that, an, an, a, if you like, an ageing monarch uh, will have hand over the reins to the next generation by uh, abdicating at a, an appropriate time. Now, one of the things I emphasise in the book is that it's, there's a great opportunity for King Charles to, to modernise this institution. We haven't seen it so far. The first year of his reign has been about st stability, continuity, caution. Um, I think there's a, there's a real opportunity here, and I think it's an opportunity that must be shared uh, with uh, with William. I think this is a, a joint project that father and son have to lead, and that when the appropriate time comes, 10, 15 years from now, maybe even 20 years what's, what's from the now, most in... um, the, the reins be handed on. Ed, what's the most important thing they need to do? OK, there's, there's lots of uh, things that I suggest in the book, and I set out a concrete plan for change, how it would come about uh, politically, but also with the emphasis on public support, uh, a discussion in the media. I think this institution needs to be more democratic, more transparent, more accountable. One of the things that sort of crept into the reign of Elizabeth II was a lot of secrecy, a lot of secrecy in terms of how the court engages with politicians, but also a lot of secrecy in terms of the family's archive. Um, I think this institution needs demystification. We think we know how it works, but we don't really. And I think uh, in order to appeal to a younger generation who do care a lot more about accountability and transparency in public life, the, the king could set a really important example uh, to, to, the, to other public figures, to politicians, by making this institution more transparent, by making it more accountable. OK, all right. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, Helena Kennedy, I, now, you are a convert, I understand it, because you started, <laughs> you started life youth? as a Republican yeah. and, and, you, and then moved on to have an actual role in the, in the coronation. Well, correct. I, I did. Um, it's very interesting because if you look at all the statistics, you know, the young are the, are the section of, of our, our communities that feel that, that well, why do we need royalty and why can't we have a president? And I was one of those people who, when I was in my 20s, felt that too. But I you thought, grew you know, out why? of it. Well, well, let me tell you, if, if anybody cures you of the idea of presidency, you only have to look around the world. <laughs> and, uh, and certainly the United States has inspired me thinking of uh, Donald Trump. Um, so I, I actually do think that um, I, I, as I became much more um, interested in how the Constitution works, I actually do think that there's a stability that's given by the continuum that there is by having uh, a monarchy. But I agree, I mean, I agree with Ed, for example, about transparency and much greater, uh, a much greater sense of, of how the whole thing works. And actually, I do think that there has to be a continued modernisation. But I do think that actually um, the King and Queen are, are pretty much on the button when it comes to this. I mean, the person that I was, um, who invited me to be part of her, um, uh, you know, um, group who were supporting uh, her by carrying her regalia, um, was the Queen. I mean, I, I've known Queen Camilla for, for uh, many years before she was ever um, even the Duchess of Cornwall, um, and she and I and I am engaged with her on lots of things to do with women and women's rights, mm -hmm. and she's very interested in all of this. She's been very engaged with f issues like domestic violence and speaking out about it. She has been very she. 
hosts a thing on International Women's Day, and she's a real modern woman. Um, and, and I think that she actually is a great asset um, to the royal family. Can so I, it's about that, about more of that. Ed is advocating abdication. So, <laughs> I mean, has Queen Camilla been an asset to the royal family, Ed? Oh, I, I would uh, agree with Baroness Kennedy that uh, in many respects she has engaged with issues in public life like domestic violence that were previously seen as taboo and and I think in that respect she she's speaking out on on topics that are of importance uh, to the public uh, is she an asset to the institution well I think she I think it's I think it's great that um, they were crowned together. And I think, uh, you know, the, the, this was an improbable victory earlier this year with the coronation of, of, of a king and queen who, who you never would have imagined being crowned back in the 1990s together. So I think that's, that works quite well. And it's the fulfillment, if you like, of a, of, a, of a story of true love as well. That plays quite well with the public. But when we look at the opinion polls, we can see that, that Queen Camilla isn't particularly popular, especially with the younger generations. We started by talking about Catherine, Prince of Wales. She is far and above of the most uh, popular member of the British royal family, closely followed by uh, Prince William. And then we get to King Charles and finally Queen Camilla. Uh, and Queen Camilla's uh, po poll ratings are much more divided, around about 50% positive, 50% negative. And that's simply because of, if you like, the hangover of the 1990s, the War yeah. of the Wales is back then, what happened very yeah. publicly. The, the numbers are pretty stark when you look at the divide on ages. Richard, this is an interesting one for the SNP, isn't it? Because the party tends to hedge its bets. Do you think an independent Scotland would keep the monarchy? Oh, certainly the SNP's policy to, to maintain the, the monarchy. And I think there's an argument there about continuity in terms of the social union that people speak about, that you're ending the, the union of the parliaments, but you're not ending the, the union of the crowns and under that version of, of, of independence. And I think that would be valuable for a lot of people. I mean, I would kind of class myself as a pretty unenthusiastic Republican for many of the reasons that Baroness Kennedy is. You'll has find given yourself taking it's... part in a coronation. <laughs> well, I mean, you don't know. Yeah. Well, let's, let's hope not. I think my invitation is probably forever lost in the post. <laughs> I've filled my nest on that one. But it's simply about, you know, what, what would you, you replace the institution with? And I think, to be honest, in terms of transparency and accountability, I, I take the arguments that are being made here, but I'm much more interested in the transparency and accountability, not of the ceremonial aspects of the Constitution, but the political side of the Constitution. And for the very, very recent example in Boris Johnson of uh, what happens when you have a Prime Minister who is effectively out of control. Yeah. And uh, I would far rather see energies being put into things like coming up with a written Constitution, a Bill of Rights, codifying that and making it very, very clear what ministers can and cannot do and having the constitutional court in place to keep ministers in check. I think that's a far more <laughs> radical uh, version of the reforms that we need. And uh, I would love to look on from an independent Scotland and how the and rest that. of the UK is getting on with <laughs> okay. that. Well, I still miss Queen Elizabeth. It still hurts to think she's still not, she's not there. But um, one of Ed's, well, I think Ed's recommendations is very interesting. But what I really disagree with is the idea of thinning down the monarchy. And I think oh. Princess Anne has made this point. Actually, you know, we had Sophie visit Salisbury recently and there is a role where the royal family need in terms of opening hospitals visiting charities supporting charities you need a critical number mm -hmm. for them to better service the whole country that's their, their roots in the communities is a big part of their support mm -hmm. and the princess anne has already made the point you know a lot of them are getting older and yes. actually do need a certain number of working royals to actually perform those public functions. And do you think young voters can be won over just finally? Listen, what was wonderful was just to, to view the coronation through my da young daughter's eyes and they were learning about crowns and things like that and thrones and the COVID. But, but I've got a long-standing girl crush on Kmid, the Princess of Wales, and increasingly <laughs> so... In K K Mid, <laughs> increasingly <laughs> so on Queen Camilla, and that's because of their work on early years, on their work in fighting... And it, they passionately believe it and they're using their platform for public good but they they will do long-term work that the political world doesn't often get an opportunity to do and that's why I don't think the danger is there that Ed perhaps speaks to about the royal family. Okay all right well Dr Ed Owens thank you very much for joining us well, I'm sure that your book thank is you being much. passed round at the palace they're uh, they're all take looking at it with interest I'm sure. Uh, that is all we have time for today but I will be back tomorrow with more Politics Live. We're on at 12.15 because there's no PM keys tomorrow. Uh, join us here on BBC Two and on the BBC iPlayer. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.